Hello, everybody. I'm Lee Young from Charisma. I'm the Managing Executive. And I'd really like to give you a warm welcome in attending our webinar. I hope you enjoy it thoroughly. I'm going to hand you over to um, MJ, who will be doing the introduction of Dr. D Brad Byra. He is the CEO of Genoa. Over to you, Michael. Thank you, Lee. Uh, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to another one of the Genoa Underwriting Managers um, CPD events. We are very, very pleased to be addressing you guys this afternoon, ladies and gents in the room. Um, I'm joined today by two people who are very familiar to me, but who may not be as familiar to yourselves. The first is Jeanette de Villiers uh, of MC de Villiers Brokers. She is the lady who is responsible for the placement of uh, uh, the professional indemnity and medical malpractice insurances that uh, we've, we've placed on behalf of the Charisma Nursing Scheme. Um, and then the second person who uh, we are joined with today, who's going to be in fact addressing us is Dr. Brad Byra. Brad is a, a very accomplished uh, speaker and um, uh, he holds a number of uh, different degrees uh, for a multitude of different, um, different things across his career. Today, he, however, is going to be addressing us on de-risking the nursing practice or your nursing practice and the ethical guidelines that are associated with that. So we'll be hearing from Jeanette as well a little bit later this afternoon. But for now, I'm going to hand over to Dr. Byra. And I really hope that you all enjoy the talk and um, please take away from it as much as you can. I'm sure it's going to be a great one. Brad, over to you. Thanks, Brad. Thank you, MJ. Thank you, Lee. Thank you, Jeanette. Hi to everyone. Happy, what's today? Happy Wednesday. Sometimes I forget which day it is. And increasingly over COVID, it, it became harder and harder to know which day it was. But um, very nice to, to um, virtually see you all. I say virtually because I can, you can all see me. I can't see most of you. I think what I'd like to suggest as we go forward, I've, there, there, there was a guy who, who wrote a great book on um, communication. He said, if you can't say it in nine slides, don't say it. So I'm going to say it in nine slides times three. I've got 27 slides, but there's lots to talk about, especially as we go through this. My, my general sense after having done these for a couple of years, especially over these digital platforms, is if you've got a question, raise it up into the chat and type it out to me and I'll try to answer it in real time. Because usually what happens is you've got a great question and you can be assured if you've got it, everyone else has it as well. So stop me, uh, type it in. I'll have a look at it. I'll be able to see it in the chat box. It comes up as a question. Elizabeth, can you hear now? Um, you see, it's that kind of thing where I can ask and see. So if um, Elizabeth can hear, um, Luella is also saying she can't hear. Um, let's check and see. I know my mic is on. Can somebody write back to me and tell me that you can hear before we start? I most certainly can hear you, Brad. Okay, so uh, those of you that can't hear, please will you send a, a message through and, and we'll carry on. I'm sorry for those of you that can't hear. Hi to all of you that can. Um, and this is how we're going to kick off. The, we're going to start and say, this is really a, a lecture about practical experience. And it's called a theory because it doesn't work in practice. I'm going to share with you what's happened in South African legislation and regulations because from an ethics position, you need to know that. I'm also going to share some practical experience. I'm new to, to health risk. I've been doing it since 1998. I've probably done uh, root cause analysis and, and quality outcomes assessments in more than 400 hospitals around the world. So I'm going to share with you some of that. And specifically today, I'm going to talk. I'm not a nurse. So I can't talk about the challenges of nursing. But I can talk about the challenges in an interdisciplinary healthcare team and some of the things I've found as we've gone through nursing excellence around the around the world. Um, there's a very nice book that you might want to read, uh, written by a general surgeon called Atul Gawande. And the book is called Checklist Manifesto. And what it goes through is, how do we make sure that quality is good in nursing and healthcare? And what do we currently do and what do we do well? What his book, he, he was commissioned by the World Health Organization to write this book, to get an understanding, not to write the book, but to do the research, on why do we get bad outcomes when we think we're being diligent? 
what we find is we usually leave at least one thing out. If we're doing a central line, we don't drape the body toes to nose. If we are going into theater, we don't take the time to greet each other properly. So we're not sure who's doing what. We don't do our counts properly at the end. We don't check um, the vitals or key essential areas of the body. We don't um, chart as well as we could. So that's a little bit about what today's about. So as I go through, as I've said, ask the questions you want to ask. If I don't know it, I'll make it up. And oh, no, wait, that's only in clinical practice. If I don't know, I'll, I'll look it up. So I'll put this, this big wheel up that you can see on the, on the right hand side of your screen. And safe practice management, when we, when we talk about it, really breaks up into four different components. It breaks up into the components of us as people. So we talk about in the National Health Act providers, healthcare professionals, and we talk about the user. But actually, when we talk about practitioner, patient, parent, we're talking about people. And sometimes we forget that. How we manage each other, how we communicate, what we share, how sensitive we are, when do we need emotion and when do we actually need to have less emotion becomes quite important. Then how do we record it? So I'm going to talk to you in a, in a little bit and probably the bulk of today is about um, record keeping. And then what's the treatment that we're giving? And then ultimately, when we look at why people sue each other the most, it's not because of delayed care or poor outcomes. It's because of billing. You did something, I didn't like it, and you billed me for it. So amazingly, when we look at the records, more than half the records on, on um, dispute or care dispute is around billing challenges. And then I want to talk a little bit, and, and, and this is within our cycle, what is our responsibility? Well, we've got our conduct responsibilities. How do we behave? Then there's the consent and permissions. Then there's confidentiality and how we manage disclosure. And now we've got Poppy in addition to the National Health Act. And then there's the clinical proficiency. And I'm going to talk a little bit about what that means for yourselves as nurses. But then we've also got the patient's responsibilities. They are responsible. And just pause for a second. How many of you have heard of something called the National Patient Rights Charter? It's only been around for like 24 years. And basically, the National Patient Rights Charter says we have rights and obligations as, as providers, but the patient has rights. They also have obligations in terms of being accountable for their health. They've got obligations in terms of full disclosure, and they've got obligations in terms of continuity of care. Because sometimes what happens is we treat somebody, then they don't take their meds, and then they blame us. There's equally the times when they take their meds and they're the wrong meds because of us. So there's that fine balance in the healthcare cycle of what we need to get right. So that's generally when I talk about safe um, practice management, what I'm referring to. And I'm sure all of you think about this every day when you wake up, you say, right, where am I in the healthcare cycle? I'm perfectly balanced. So you're the wrong people to be listening because we're really talking to people who don't do this well. So here's my challenge to you as we go forward. I'm going to talk to you a little bit about the legislation. And whilst you should know it in theory, you don't really have to know that we talk about the scope of practice, which is section 56 of the Nursing Act. But you do need to know that there is a Nursing Act and others, and I'll take you through those. Then we're going to go through informed consent, charting and record keeping, disclosure, a little bit about root cause analysis, some things that I find that are, are, are particularly uh, poorly done, and it's not your fault, but it's a, just a general culture, handovers and timeouts and where that gets us into trouble. I've got two persons sitting keeping an eye on me here, so if I keep looking to my side, it's to make sure that they're not um, vigorously disagreeing with me. So the guidelines and legislation that you need to know of, at the very least, is the National Health Act. And when we get into informed consent at section six and seven, can extend up to section nine around what you should or shouldn't share. Then there's your Nursing Act and your regulations. So the Nursing Act is the act of, of 2005, it's act number 33. It's very good if you're sitting around the table and you quote this, people go like, mm, that's very cool. But you also need to know the uh, revised regulations which came out in 2013. And then in, in terms of SANC, you've got your code of ethics for nursing practitioners. So that's the core relevant guideline and legislation. Depending on where you practice, whether you're in a general ward or whether you're in ICU or high care or you're a scrub nurse or a circulating nurse, depending on what you do, you will have requirements that may be hospital specific or output specific that you need to add to this. But these are the minimums that you need to know. And when you do, 
when you, you heard me talk earlier about needing to know and, and, and making sure that you know, the Nursing Act defines competencies as the specific knowledge, skills, and judgments that you have in addition to personal attributes. Now, those are quite different because one might be able to teach knowledge, skills, and judgment, but personal attributes are who we are as people and why we became healthcare professionals, why I went into the work that I do, why you became a nurse, but that's what a competency is, is that set of skills. Competence is the level of performance or what you do, because you can read what's on the slide there. It's the, what you do to make sure that you are safely and ethically doing what you're supposed to be doing. So you can pass your competencies, but you might not have competence. Now that becomes quite important if there's a, an outcome that's a bad outcome where a patient begins to complain. Two things that they ask is, did you have the necessary skills? In other words, did you have the competencies? And then did you apply those competencies in a good way? In other words, did you do them with competence? And when we talk about this, you may or may not have heard of something called the reasonable person test. So the reasonable person test goes like this, and it's, it's a general standard in, in common law. It says, what would a person with the same or similar training as you in a same or similar circumstance do to get a same or similar outcome. And if the other people would do something different to what you did, you would fail that reasonable person's test. And that's really the test of competence. And then as we go forward, and part of the reason that, that you're sitting here today, I know you're not sitting here because you've got nothing else to do, is the issue of the, your ongoing ability to integrate and apply your knowledge where it's needed. And that's continuing competence. And that's where CPD and CME and ongoing education comes in because it's called a theory because it doesn't work in practice. So the theory of healthcare says everyone will work well, we'll integrate together, we'll all be respectful. Patient will tell us everything that's going on. They'll remember all the meds that they're taking. But in reality, we forget those kind of things. And maybe we didn't do everything that we should have done. Maybe we did. I'm going to share some, some examples over the, the last couple of years that I've been directly or peripherally involved in. I was head of risk for a specialty orthopedic hospital for a while. And always when there was a root cause analysis, the people who were pale were the nurses because they said, well, everything's gonna be blamed on us. But all the way through your, cont uh, your, your continuum of care, there's gotta be not only your competence, but your ongoing learning. So the question as, that I'm gonna ask you as we go forward is how good are you at the things that I'm showing where I can show that we've, we're not so good. How diligent are you? How competent are you? And how much competence do you have? So the theory is that the practice of nursing is, and this is in section 2.3 of your regulations, is a dynamic process. The emphasis is mine because dynamic means it's ever going, ever flowing and evolving. It's not a static process, which means that there are a huge amount of variables that can um, influence you. And so often when I used to do this and say, well, what you do is you greet the patient, you take the case history, you record everything. And somebody would say, yes, and then the phone rings, or then there's a code blue, or then there's a crisis, or then the patient next door falls out of bed. And so the dynamic process also includes how we manage the fluid world around us in order for us to maintain and provide the care that we want to give. Now, there are limitations to your practice, like there's limitations to everyone. That's why tongue in cheek um, earlier on, I said, well, it's the provisions of section 56 of your act. And it helps for you to know that because you have within your regulations, the requirements to assess, diagnose, prescribe treatment and can keep and supply meds for specific illnesses and conditions, but they've got limitations except where they don't. So there are areas uh, in your practice where if the district surgeon or, or other healthcare um, MEC providers say so, you can shift and your scope of practice increases. So you need to make sure wherever it is that you're working, that you fully understand the beginnings and the end of your diagnostic, therapeutic and interventive responsibilities, because they're different. And they're different in private hospitals from public hospitals, and they're different from, from the ER into uh, general ward, into high care, into ICU. So you just need to make sure as you go through within the dynamic practice of your nursing accountabilities. Who are you accountable to and how are you doing that work? I can see that um, I've stunned you into a terrified silence or you've got me on, um, 
on the, the, the screen while you're making lunch. So both ways is okay. You know, if you're making lunch, please send some my way because they won't feed me here. What you need to, to, to bear in mind as well is that when we discuss professional and ethical practice, that means you've got to demonstrate your knowledge and your insight into laws and regulations. And knowledge and insight are different. You can record section 56, as I've mentioned earlier, but understanding what that means in your nursing practice or your midwifery practice, or within the context of healthcare in, in, in the country makes a huge difference. And I say that because we've moved into a position now where because of COVID, and there was a little bit before COVID, but significantly since then, we're using telemedicine and telehealth a lot more, which means somebody might phone you and while they call you, they might hold up something and they might say, what do you think of this over here? And now based on that, you need to give an insight or you need to give a diagnostic opinion or you need to say, well, this looks like A, B or C. So part of your ethical practice is evolving. So not only do you need to practice in accordance with the laws that we've spoken about, you have also have to look after the human rights of individuals and groups. And that can be more complicated because one of them is the rights to dignity in the Bill of Rights. The second is your rights to bodily integrity. The thirds are your rights of expression. The fourth is your rights to the access or adequate access to healthcare. So all of those are in the Bill of Rights. Plus then you've got the rights of individuals in terms of this national um, patient rights chart. So I'm saying that not to overwhelm you, but just to give you the context that when we talk about ethics in healthcare, it's a tremendously broad environment that comes down to your continuing knowledge and insight and application of your skills to get the best possible outcomes as often as possible. And I say that because there are times where despite your best efforts, the outcomes are gonna be poor. Despite your best efforts, complications arise, secondary infections arise, comorbidities present and sometimes people die. So recognizing that and recognizing with that comes stress is part of your professional and ethical practice is around how you manage your environmental stress. So at this point, just as we, we go forward and we say, part of it is to accept and assume your accountability and responsibility for your actions and emissions. The action is what you do. The emission is what you, you've left out. And sometimes what we've left out is what gets us into trouble, not only what we've done. So you can cause injury or harm by commission, by what you do, or by emission by what you've left out. And sometimes one of those emissions is looking after yourself. So how is your self-care? How often are you decompensating? How often are you getting somebody to help you decompress? How often are you speaking about the stresses that you've got in a safe environment? Because that's super important, but no one ever talks about that. So when I start to see people where there's stress and there's a root cause analysis, the very first question I ask is, who's looking after you? during these stressful times. And finally, when my last words on, on, on the scope of ethics and practice before we get into the meaty stuff is when we talk about your ethical considerations, there are three core tests. The first test is your social justice test. Is this fair? Is this equitable? Are we meeting the needs of the people? The second is to do no harm. Non-beneficence is to not do harm and beneficence is to do good. So you've got to ask yourself, is this what I'm doing for this person or these people or this community consistent with the objectives of what we're trying to do as a community and as a society? Am I making sure that I'm not doing harm? Because doing good and not doing harm are different things. So if you go back into your guidelines, have a look at that. Because when we start talking about the reasonable practitioner, we look at your conduct when something goes wrong. And you'll notice no one looks at your conduct when everything goes right. There's no root cause analysis to say who was the best person on the day. There's always a root cause analysis to try and find what was the cause of the failure. So sadly for me, we often goal set, but we don't often goal celebrate. And one of the challenges I work with, Professor Ethel Wynne Stellenberg, she's a professor of nursing emeritus down in the Western Cape. My frustration with her, and I think it was very unfortunate that the year of the nurse, which was 2010, was overshadowed by the year of the virus. But my challenge to you, one of my big challenges is how do you celebrate what you do collectively and individually every day? So the final piece of legislation, which has changed our lives a little bit, 
is the Protection of Personal Information Act. Now, as long as there's been a nursing act, and as long as there's been a National Health Act, and as long as we've been providing care, there's always been our burden of responsibility to maintain confidentiality. We're not supposed to take our records and share them with, with everyone else. But I've walked in hospital wards where I've watched people take notes out of files and give them to attorneys. And then three or four days later, the, the, the notes are back in the file. So we do that. And I'm not saying you do that, but I'm saying as a profession, we do that because some people get paid and, and they get unfairly incentivized. So what we've got to recognize is that personal information is private and it's now protected by law in addition to the National Health Act, where we should have already been doing this. And in addition to, we can't really talk so much about the, the beyond the code of ethics for nursing practices, but when we measured in healthcare, we are also measured on the Health Professions Council's ethical guidelines. So if you can't sleep, it's a really good um, series of 16 booklets. It's only 384 pages of what we should or shouldn't do. Um, I'm getting a note to say that the speakers are not audible. Um, Please, uh, Anna, I'm sorry that you're not able to hear right now. Um, obviously, Anna can't hear. But um, those are some of those things where we start to say, can you understand me? And, I, and I'm going to tell you, I'll tell you a case now that I, that I got this morning. I got a case this morning of, of a chap who has now unfortunately reached a point where his lower limb was amputated. And his lower limb was amputated. But while he was intubated, he was having pain in that lower limb. You'll see there's a couple of stories like this as we go through. This is today's story. But he said, well, no one could understand me because I was intubated. But I was indicating that my leg was sore. And why didn't anyone check my pulses? So, well, after the fact, you've become a medical expert and you're, you're now a vascular expert to know to check for pulses. But at the time, we don't always know what it is that we don't know. So the challenge that you're going to face is communication and how you communicate. So when we get criticized in healthcare, you need to understand that it's not only your code of ethics and your code of practice that you criticized under. So I would strongly suggest that you do check the HPCSA guidelines um, and, and, and become familiar with them. So guidelines one and two is how we're supposed to behave as healthcare professionals. Guideline three is the uh, National Patient Rights Charter. We're gonna also talk about guidelines four, five, and nine, which is informed consent, disclosure, and record keeping. So with that as the, the, the baseline, there was a, a, a chap by the name of James Reason, and he wrote a model called the Swiss cheese model. And he wrote that almost, well, 24 years ago, but here in, you can see his, his note from 2000. So his note from 2000 says, despite our best efforts to stop something happening, every action we take is a little bit like Swiss cheese. It's got little holes in it. And so where there's holes in it, those holes sometimes, despite our best efforts, line up. So our resourcing and our funding and our policies and our technical designs and our um, team structures and our handovers and our fatigue and our training all come together and all of those gaps allow that particular patient to, to uh, experience harm. So I'm sharing with you now uh, an, what's called an unintended harm from a volume model uh, note that was written in general surgery news by, by a, a practitioner, Bruce Ramshaw. So this is 20 years after the, the, the James Reason model. This is a guy who had his leg amputated. Why did he have his leg amputated? because he went in for a hernia operation to get mesh, an inguinal hernia operation. Also sounds fair, right? But he'd had a couple of procedures before, and this was a complicated procedure. So what they decided is they weren't going to extubate him. They were going to finish the procedure the, the next day. So they left him intubated. But when the surgery happened, what the surgeon thought was the inferior epigastric artery was actually the femoral artery. So the wrong artery was clamped. And it was only the next day when they extubated him that uh, they realized that they'd clamped the wrong artery. But the nursing records at the time showed that both legs were warm, both feet were warm, and the distal pulses were present. It turns out that the distal um, pulse wasn't present and the foot wasn't warm, but the records show that they were in terms of the responses. So we have to bear in mind that um, 
sometimes, and you look at the Swiss cheese model, he'd had complications before. They left him intubated. The nurses didn't check the legs. And only after the vascular damage was done was he extubated. The consequence of that was he lost the, 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 um, the lower limb at the knee. So now you have harm. Part of the reason was the practitioner was, was, was running a high volume surgical practice and everything aligned in the worst possible way. Now, this is what happens when we see patient harm. It's a combination of failures of controls. And some of those failures are our questioning. Some of it is our consent. And I'm gonna take you through some of those examples now. So there was a question, can, can I share this with you? Very happy to share it with, um, with, the, with the Charisma and, and the broker and uh, MJ. And um, if they're happy to share it with you, I've got no problems with that. You'll also see on everything that I'm doing, it's all referenced. So you'll be able to check it up to see if I'm telling the truth or not. So let's talk about informed consent. This is a requirement under the National Health Act. and says, in each and every case, you need to have consent. It needs to be informed. It needs to be literacy and literate independent. And it has to be for each procedure or intervention or treatment that you do. There are elements where consent can't be given. So if, if the person is unconscious, if this is a life-saving um, transition, but we're not talking about those. We're, we're talking about those cases where the patient is conscious, the patient is competent, the patient is of legal age where they can give consent. So I wanna to talk to you about a case, and this is a case that, that I reviewed, where are we now? We're in June, so a month ago. This is the wrong ankle at the right time. So this person needed uh, the, the ankle repair to be done from an, an orthopedic point of view, but what had happened is when they applied for um, surge, for, for the um, pre-authorization, they asked for the right leg to be done and not the left leg or the left leg to be done. So let's say they asked for the right leg to be done, but it was the left leg. When the medical scheme came back and authorized and gave the pre-authorization, what did they do? They said, we've, we've pre-authorized the right leg, but it was the left leg. But now everything in admissions into hospital says the right leg. So when the person comes in, they say, we're going to do your right leg. They say, right. And when they're in the, in the, in the ward, the nurse says, we're going to do your right leg. And the person says, yes. And off they go all the way down this journey, all the way through the handovers. They get into the theater and the, the, the PAX machine isn't working. And ultimately the wrong side gets operated on because of the double negative confirmation. There was the wrong confirmation in the rooms. There was the wrong confirmation going through to the hospital. And then each time the patient was asked, they gave the wrong answer. So at the end of the day, who's at fault? Was the practitioner at fault? Was the admin at fault? Was the hospital at fault? At which point do we double check a double negative confirmation? So these are the kind of things that happen. And they happen with sentinel events, wrong site surgery, wrong name surgery, right person, wrong procedure. They happen with right person, wrong medicine. And just now we're gonna talk about the five rights of medicine. So try and think now, what are the five rights of, of, of safe medication? And I lectured this for, for the WHO across the, the um, SAD, the SADC countries. And I'm amazed at how few people, and don't Google this, if you don't know, don't know. Um, Cause I know some of you are reaching for your phones and checking five rights to see. But these are the kind of things that, that, um, that do happen. So with informed consent, it used to be back in, in what was called the Bolam judgments that the patient should be told whatever you want to tell them, you as the practitioner. After 2015, it became that the patient should be told whatever they want to know, not only what you think that they should be told. In addition, that the patient should be told what a reasonable person in that patient's position would likely add value and significance to, and that you should be aware of. So wherever it says doctor, replace the word doctor with me. The patient should be told whatever they want to know, not what I think they should know. And the reasonable person in the patient's position should be told what they're likely to attach significance to, not what I think they should be aware of. And this was um, in 2015. British Medical Journal wrote about this in 2017. 
But the challenge has fundamentally shifted because now I have to think about what do you need to know and what is significant for you, not only what I want to tell you. So if there's a risk that you're going to get a bed sore and I don't tell you, well, I should have told you. If there's a risk that that catheter is going to have an infection, I, I need to tell you these things. If there's a risk that you could slip and fall and break your hip, I need to tell you that. So falls risks, while we talk about falls risks and the sentinel event that goes with it, what are you telling your patients and their families and are you telling them enough? And that got updated a little bit more. So the first judgment that I told you about came out of the UK in 2015. The second one, which is this Chanel v. Toms, came out in the US in 2017. Now, both of these countries use common law, which we also use here. We use a combination of laws, but these judgments have application to us. And this judgment says that it's the physician's duty to obtain and provide information to the patient sufficient to get their consent. And it's not delegable. You cannot have somebody ask you to get consent on their behalf. So you shouldn't be getting consent for a surgeon or for an anesthesiologist or for anyone else doing the um, procedures. Now, you have to check what your hospital says and what your environment says, but you need to bear in mind that when we start looking at judgments and the cases that come up, these play quite a big role. And so these, these bits of information are things that you should be looking and saying, well, how am I on informed consent? When a patient's asking me questions, am I thorough enough? When I first see that patient in the ward, am I checking with them? Is this right, right, or is this left, right? And sometimes I'm going to ask you, is this left? And you say, right. Well, does that mean it's correct or does that mean it's the right side? So challenges, my challenge to you is, are you as clear with your patients or the patients that you're taking care of as you could, should, or might be? So then this is one of my favorite slides. Um, and it's, it's, it's equal now in, in electronic medical records. So the piece on the right is all the scribble, the medical alphabet. And I often joke and say, well, how did we get into medical school? And it, when, when, when I applied, it was all handwritten. There was no type stuff. And so if they could read your writing, they threw you out. If they couldn't read your writing, you were accepted. And I remember when I first got into, into private practice in, in 96, I had the pharmacist come around to say hi to me and ask me to write down a couple of things. He typed them out on the one side and I wrote them out. I said, why are you writing them out? He says, because I'm never going to read your writing. I'm just going to best guess estimate the two against each other. And I see that often as the case. I sometimes look and it looks like a spider climbed into some ink and had a seizure. And, and we, we take pride sometimes in writing badly. Equally, and, and I, I say this sadly, I, I worked as... Um, as the head of a welfare home. And there were a lot of um, intellectually disabled persons and the practitioner would send an illegible script or the practitioner would phone in and the nurse would transcribe it and transcribe it with a decimal point in the wrong place if there was a decimal point at all. So we've got to realize that legibility plays a major role. And as I take you through this, the, the conversation for the next 20 minutes, the issues on record keeping, charting and, and, and legibility plays a massive role. In my, in my practice now, I only use electronic records and I don't know what's worse, the typing errors because um, you can write uh, PNR or PRN and they mean completely different things. So NAD and, and, and NDA or, or NPM mean different things. So making sure that your, your acronyms are, are correct and they're not typos is, is um, as important now as it, as it ever was. So let's recognize here, in, in the HBCSA booklet, it's, it's booklet nine, and in your code of ethics for nursing, the issue of record keeping is fundamental. And it's the written evidence of interaction between and amongst healthcare professionals, especially in your environment, where you've got multiple persons providing care. And there are multiple people giving inputs, not only the patients and their families. This includes your evidence of, of administration of, of procedures and treatments and tests and medicines and the patient's response to them. And the patient's response to them is a big deal. So very early on when I started in the medical legal work, I had a, a, a really interesting um, case that, that was in the US where the patient had surgery and the doctor came to see them 
And every day the doctor would come in and would say, so how are you doing? Is everything good? How are the kids? Did you watch the ice hockey? Did you watch the football? What's going on? What's news? And they'd read the chart at the end of the bed and they'd say, great, see you tomorrow. And I, the period, by the time of discharge, the um, doctor sent a bill to the patient. The patient said, I'm not paying this bill. You have to itemize what you did. So the, the, this went all the way up to the Supreme Court. And ultimately, what, what had come out at the end was the doctor said, for coming to see you every day, no charge. For asking about you and your family, no charge. For making small talk and, and general conversation, no charge. For reading your charts and understanding the interpretations, no charge. For knowing what not to do, my fee. And that was ultimately where they got their fee. But notwithstanding that, if you haven't got a document of care given to the patient, how can you remember what you did? Or how can you make sure that you've got um, done or planning to do what's right? And so in your Nursing Act, it states, record the pertinent information. Now, pertinent becomes important because what is pertinent and what is interesting and what is ancillary and what is response to intervention? So I'm going to take you through a little bit of that now. But I want to start by saying it's your persuasive witness because it's a description of facts. So there was a case recently, and it was AM versus the MEC of the Western Cape. It was finally uh, reported on at the end of June 2020. So this is a six-year-old boy who's playing around at home, falls down on the carpeted floors and hits his head on the stairs, has a bump on the back of his head, but he's not too miserable. An hour later, his dad comes home takes him to Red Cross Children's Hospital to the emergency room where he's triaged by the nurse. Once he's triaged by the nurse, he's seen by the emergency room doc who notes a bump at the back of the head. His um, GCS is normal, pupils are pearl. You know that pupils are pearl means they equal and responsive to light. He's 15 over 15 on his neurological tests and he's ultimately discharged. He falls asleep in the car on, on the way home. No problems, it's now probably eight o'clock at night, he's been out, he's six, he's tired. He goes, um, he's woken up, he's taken to bed, sleeps with his folks. Three in the morning, his dad wakes up, Papa's three, can't wake him. The child seizes and wets his bed. Turns out that he's got a significant intracranial bleed and he's now profoundly cerebral palsy. So now there's the seven and a half year court case to decide whether the emergency room doctor was to blame and the nurse was to blame and all that could be done was a review of the records to see. And it came down as to whether the bump was soft or squishy or spongy form or firm. So when I do root cause analysis work and I try and not do it too often because it's like sucking the air out of my soul, what it ultimately comes down to is what's not written was not done. So you need to make sure that everything you do is related to, um, to your records. Because the, the charting, in addition to showing what was done, it reflects your character, your competency. We spoke about competence and competency earlier, and it shows the care that you delivered, both individually and as a team. So what should be on your chart? Your procedure name, when it was performed, who performed it, how it was performed, how your patient tolerated it, and any adverse reactions. That we know. It should also include any phone calls and the content of those calls. If any healthcare team people came in and visited, when did they visit? It should also include what the client refuses because the client doesn't have to have the care. They can refuse, but then you need to note. It's like a discharge AMA against medical advice. You also need to chart the client or the patient's subjective data. Also, if you've added medicine or forgotten medicine, and if you've got late entries, you need to put the date and time of that entry because the timestamp might not match. You also need to include, and you can see this is a long list, any sudden declines, what we call left shifts in the patient's condition or their actions or their outcomes. What about patient injuries? How often have you had a patient who almost fell but not quite, now they've got a groin strain or a knee strain or they bumped their elbow and that they have a bruise or they pulled out their drip and they've injured that vein. I know that we don't make any medication errors on this call, but if there were medication errors, are you charting those? And I'm going to talk about how to chart them later. Was there any equipment failure? Was there any incorrect use of equipment? Did you um, have the SpO2 and cardiac monitor? 
was it on but not quite on maybe they were, it wasn't making good contact were the leads making good contact was there any failure of a provider to respond i'm dealing with a matter at the moment where the patient and the family said but we called out and no one came now the nurse says well yes they called out but the uh, medical records from the, the the other healthcare professionals say they didn't come till the next day so you need to make sure that there's an alignment of, of record keeping. And then red flag patients or red flag family. That includes aggression, non-communicative patients on narcotics and mind on altering substances, patients with fall risks, and then anything else that you've done with family education. Because in the case earlier, one of the questions that was asked by, by the judge was, well, when you discharged the six-year-old boy, what advice did you give to the parents? What did you tell the father? to look out for? Did you tell the father to keep the child awake or to waken them up every two hours? So instructions that you're giving play a big role. And I remember this happening to me where patients were being discharged who weren't English speaking with bags of Klexane injections, single use injections, and being told in not their first language that they needed to use the anticoagulant in the following way. But we knew that those patients had no idea what was going on. And you'll know as I'm saying this, you'll be thinking, well, the risk of pulmonary emboli is increasing by the day. So instructions and education are part of what should be kept in your charting. And then ultimately it comes down to detail is everything. So here's an example. What's the less correct way is communication with patients' family began, uh, began today to specify the manner in which the condition is progressing and suggest probable consequences. As opposed to I contacted the person's wife at this time, I explained that his cardiac status was worsening. He was being prepared for cardiac cath procedure scheduled at that time. So you want to try in your charting. This is the theory. You want to try and be as detailed and specific as possible. But the reality is the time ticks and you're doing multiple things. So you've got to make sure that you're leaving enough time in what you're doing for the charts to be done. And it's the same with the record keeping of your telephonic instruction. I don't know how many of you keep uh, telephonic instructions. Nowadays, if you're using a mobile phone, probably you should record the instruction and then save it and play it back. Um, there's also challenges around a hospital scenario where there's a provider's order and you don't uh, agree with that order because there's an obvious error in dosage or meds or timing. So I'm not saying it's a perfect world and I'm not saying everyone who's giving you instructions is perfect and flawless. I'm saying you've got to walk between the raindrops of this and try and find the best way to record the information, both for you and for the patient and for the broader healthcare team. So I hope I'm making sense to you as we're going on. So let's look at disclosure. Disclosure is a bigger challenge and it's a big challenge because some of that disclosure is done involuntarily. So you need to make sure when you're working with charts that you're not leaving paper charts um, on the side of the bed. But if you are and it's a general ward, you can almost be assured that there'd be some curious guy like me who walks past and opens and has a look at the chart. Who's a curious guy like me that you need to be aware of? Somebody who's representing a plaintiff attorney firm who's being paid to look for people who've got complications so that the attorney can be retained by the patient to sue the hospital and the caregivers. So one of the reasons that you don't want to leave the chart around is firstly, it's no one else's business what's going on with that patient. Secondly, is you don't want to give anyone else the opportunity to start going through and second guessing the documentation. And what's true for paper charts is, is true for computer screens and a nursing station, as much as we think it's not, a nursing station's in a public space because people walk past it. Does that make sense to you? I hope so, because I walk past nursing stations all the time. Sometimes there's snacks, sometimes there's a mobile phone, sometimes there's somebody's bag open, but always the computer screen is on. So also be, be aware that, um, that the content of what you discuss needs to be only with people directly involved with the care or those authorized by the patient, and you should list who they are. Because sometimes partners are not the direct relative or the um, life partner of the patient, and they don't have access or shouldn't have access to information. And I see this often where there's, there's a child 
and I'll use this as the example because it's happened to me recently where we've had a couple of matters that we've needed to, to support, where the child has four parents, mom and stepdad and dad and stepmom, or mom and stepboyfriend and dad and stepgirlfriend. And the problem is that mom and dad are fighting their custody battle and their anger with each other through the child. And now dad's girlfriend posing as stepmom, posing as mom, comes and asks for questions, wants to know what's going on with the child. And they're not allowed to know what's going on with the child unless there's been an, a written um, express. So express is written permission for that person to have access to that information. So because we live in a world that's a lot more complicated, and, and I, I, I did a talk for, for some school kids the other day and realized that the 800 kids have nearly 3,000 parents or per, per, persons giving parenting because of the extended family that, that, that goes with divorced parents. So be aware with that. Also be aware that not all partners want their, their significant other or insignificant other to have uh, knowledge of their information or their health status. And, and sometimes that creates very difficult um, problems in terms of sharing of information in an unauthorized way. So I know this is gonna cause all sorts of awful down moments, but you need to check for ID before you give information. Now, you've got to balance that around the hospital's principles and around what your, your level of responsibility is. Equally, and I hear this often, don't discuss patient information in public spaces. I'll walk in a hospital between radiology and phlebotomy and the pharmacy and the restaurant. And I'll hear people talking about patients. The difficulty is that somebody might know who that patient is and they may be able to identify that. And especially where you have higher profile people or you're going through the, what I was explaining earlier, the divorce issues where people are looking for that information. So equally, don't view patients' information that who are not in your care. And especially stay away from treating family and friends because they're only your family and your friend until something goes wrong. And then they're not your friend anymore because you give them a piece of advice, you look at their stuff, you haven't charted it, you haven't recorded it, something goes wrong, and then you were the person that missed something that needed to be done. So I'm sorry to be the voice of, of negativity, but that's really, when we talk about ethics, we're talking about the boundary full type of care, which is separate from the beneficence of the care we wanna give because we really like and care about other people. So here's my five rights of medication. How many of you got these right? Right patient, right medicine, right dose, right route, right time. Now, often we get the right patient with the right medicine and the right dose with the wrong route. And I've seen uh, people injecting or planning to inject into, into the IV line something that should be going in a different route. Or the dosage, that's an oral dosage, is different from a dosage to a push. So my question to you is, are you up to date with the five rights? Are you doing them regularly? And are you managing using uh, medication administration records? Do you keep one for each patient? Do you update them on a regular basis? Are you thorough with them? Maybe your answer is yes, and I kind of hope it is. And for 99% of you, I'm sure that it is. But just in case you're that one, please go back and see, are you testing your rights? Do you have them up somewhere so that you continually reminded? Are they at the nurse's station? Are they in the pharmacy? Strangely, if you ask the pharmacist these questions and you, you ask the pharmacy assistants, often they're not sure about the five rights either. And they're receiving a partially legible script that they're kind of guessing is 10 milligrams, not one milligram or 0.1 versus one uh, unit. So, so that's my refresh for you on medication administration. Also, I mean, this is a presentation that should take us conservatively eight hours. We're squeezing it into 55 minutes. So. I'm not going to spend a lot more time on that, but it is going to segue us into transitions of care. So one of the big areas where we see a lot of failure and all fall down is in this issue of transitions of care. And in the issue of transitions of care, this is where not only is, is medication safety important, but also the cohesive efforts to reduce patient harm. So one of my happy jobs is I'm the, the chairperson of CASASA and CASASA is the body that accredits health services. One of the things that we do when we look at standards 
is we look to see that transitions of care are done, that there's a formal transition of care process, and that within that, you're building not only medication histories, so your best possible medication history needs to go with your best possible treatment history. Are we making sure that the person is getting what's, what's done? Are we reconciling their meds? Because often a patient will leave, they're kind of groggy, they're kind of overwhelmed, they're kind of sore, they're kind of anxious. Now they've got a bag of meds. And we always say to them, do you know what you need to take? And they go, uh-huh. We know they're saying yes, but that's more of a twitch. It's, do you want to leave? Yes. Do you understand your medicine? No, but I'm going anyway. So make, make certain that those transitions are done. Um, so the, the comment here, there are, there are 10 rights. The right to refuse, to assess, to evaluate, to educate, to write documentation. Well, yeah. So rights to refuse care is, is, is a big deal. And it, it's one of those things when, when we talk about transitions of care or medicines or others, Bear in mind that under the patient, the National Patient Rights Charter, the patient has the right not to continue care, but so does the practitioner. The practitioner has the rights to refer in the environment where the patient is non-compliant and at risk to themselves or others. So I'm gonna leave us time for questions. So I've got a couple more things. I wanna talk about handoffs because handoffs and timeouts this, this before handoffs and timeout used to be long, curly, thick hair. And as I've done more in terms of, of, of SBARs or what's the situation, background assessment and recommendation, my hair's progressively fallen out. So for handoffs, do we know the patient's name, all their um, demographic information and who the healthcare practitioners are? Do we know their dates of admission and their diagnoses and their current condition? Because often the, the diagnosis and presenting um, condition and their current condition are fundamentally different. And especially over COVID, we've seen a significant deterioration in health with emergent comorbidities that just weren't there to start with. So what you came in with, with what you have are often two different things. Equally, to be fair, the skills resourcing that we had 10 years ago and the skills resourcing that we got now are significantly different. So we're not in the same position that we were when we first learned how to do SBAR type work. So you all know um, SOAP notes, subjective objective assessment and plan or action and plan. So um, are you keeping them? Do you do them regularly? Do you create summary notes in terms of your recent events? Are you looking for changes in condition and changes in treatment and anticipating them? If, if you've got per, any person with any coagulation risk, are you checking distal pulses? Are you checking for bed sores? I'm still amazed. It blows my mind that we're still seeing patients with bed sores. How? And we know how, but it's, it's because we're not always doing as best we can do. So I wanna end off with a story of, of root cause analysis. So early on, um, so, so, so there is a question which, which I'll, I'll answer now. There's a number of people sharing computers. How will they receive their, their CPD point or, or their accreditation attendance certificates? You'll have to make a list of, of, of um, who was at each computer and then you'll send them through and share them. I have to trust you and say that you actually were there and not ten, nine friends were watching Maverick and one friend was suffering and watching me because you lost the bet. So I don't know the answer to that, but um, I'm sure we'll find a way to make that work. I wanna end up with root cause analysis as my final conversation. Because a root cause analysis says when there was a bad outcome, how did this bad outcome happen? And many hospitals use something called failure modes analysis, which says where was the point where things had their all fall down? So I'd like to refer you to, to another child case called the Michael Colombini case. Michael Colombini was a six-year-old boy. And this goes back about 12 years, give or take a, a day. He was playing... so. I, I'm particularly passionate about when we fail with care with kids. I'm passionate when we fail with care, period. And when we start looking at, at how to do things better and we work towards quality outcomes, that's ultimately what we're doing, patient safety and quality outcomes. So Michael Columbini was six, playing in, in, in the schoolyard, falls down, unconscious. So what are they worried about? Fracture, linear fracture. Um, like I told you in the, in the AM versus the MEC case. So they do a CT scan, good news, no fracture. 
bad news, tumor. So they sedate the boy, they crack the skull, they take out the tumor, take him down to the MR unit to uh, go and check that everything's okay. Here's the problem now, is the oxygen in the MR unit is not working. The Michael is starting to crash. The anesthesiologist is yelling for help. The technician is in the back room acoustically separated because of how loud the MRI unit is. And a nurse comes past the, 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 the imaging suite, hears the anesthesiologist call for help and runs in with an oxygen cylinder. The problem is oxygen cylinders are metal. So what does the, the Tesla magnet do? Is it rips the cylinder from her hands, smashes him in the head where he's just had the surgery, smashes him repeatedly and he dies. Now the question is, how did this happen? It's not good enough to say, okay, well, it's happened. We can't bring the dead child back. But in this case, the parents agreed that the outcomes of the root cause analysis in the civil case could be published. And this set the standard for MRI safety going forward. So my recommendation to you is, there's a link there and we'll, we'll share these slides. Go have a look at the link. But the question is, are we doing what we skilled and trained to do as safely as possible as often as possible in as many ways as possible. So at this point, I'm gonna hand back Jeanette to yourself. We ride on the money at, at, at five to four to, to answer some questions. I, I promise to be on my best behavior. Some of the request was that I not only gave you the theory, but also some cases and some practice. So I'm gonna hand back to you and open this up to some questions. Thank you very, very much, Brad, for an exceptional presentation as always and very, uh, truly thought provoking. Um, some key aspects that we can take away from the presentation that Brad presented this afternoon is nursing competence is an ongoing responsibility um, and for each and every professional and charting is the backbone for responsible team-based care which I think you all do each and every day. So observing a patient and um, carefully and uh, recording all aspects um, in detail is absolutely imperative. I'm sure out of the talk today that there are many aspects and components that you do on a daily basis and that you can actually implement a couple more to ensure that you get the desired outcomes um, of best practice with exceptional patient care. I'm sure there may be quite a few questions. I'd just like to say thank you very much. I'm the, the, the intermediary that looks after the Charisma Scheme and it's an absolute privilege to look after such a dynamic and visionary organization. I hope you all enjoyed the presentation and if there are any questions please can you um, pop them in the chat facility for Brad to answer them um, um, immediately thank you very very much so if I may Jeanette just while we wait to see if anyone wants to ask a question if they haven't sedated themselves for using propofol and just <laughs> got themselves calm again um, those of you who were sharing computers please each of you go online and, and, and register as if you were attending. Otherwise, we don't know who you are. So if you go on and you register as an attendee, then we'll be able to reconcile that and your, your um, certificates will be able to be sent to you. Jeanette, it looks like um, there's no questions from anyone. Um, okay, if there are no questions, I'd like to say thank you for to Genoa for sponsoring the CPD event. Thank you, Brad, for an exceptional presentation. And most importantly, thank you for all the, the participants that attended. Um, really enjoyed um, having the session with you, and I hope you have a great afternoon further. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Have a great afternoon, and thanks, Brad, thank for, for a fantastic talk. I'll be ending the, the call now. Thank you. Bye.